Welcome to our podcast, Ronald De Bruin. And uh, I'm, I've read your book. Um, it's really interesting. It's called The Brussels Da Vinci Code. It reminds me a lot of my early work in Secrets in Plain Sight in that you're looking at patterns in cities and in, in, in architecture. And, and you've, you've come up with an, a whole a panoply of really interesting correlations to a lot of them to Egypt, ancient Egypt and to astronomy as well. I'm really excited to ask you a bunch of questions today. And I, and I wanted you to give give you a chance to introduce yourself and tell us what you do in your daily life. Well, thanks, Colt and Jeff, uh, for inviting me, first of all. And uh, uh, it's a real uh, opportunity to uh, yeah, broaden, let's say, a little bit the, uh, the, the, the story uh, to uh, a worldwide forum. Uh, because indeed, in my daily life, I'm uh, heading an intergovernmental organization in science and technology based in Brussels. Uh, and we have an organization with more than 43 countries that are member. So it's uh, it's really my daily life to make sure that science and technology are advanced. Uh, but here we're talking about, let's say, a passion of mine uh, that started uh, when I visited the uh, Nile, let's say, Delta. Uh, we went on an excursion with a small group, and the uh, idea was to go visit temples and other sites uh, in the area of Luxor. And uh, then one of my traveling companions told me, well, did you know that the pyramids along the River Nile are positioned in a way that they mimic the stars in the cosmos? And that somehow stuck to me, and I started to ask questions and uh, that I was referred to, to some reading, and after the reading, I basically understood that, ah, but this is not unique to ancient Egypt with the pyramids. It's also something that is already manifesting in other parts of, of the world, you know, in Maya Tikal, for example, or Kobleki Tepe, or uh, in Asia, uh, and not only limited to, let's say, the era of the ancient Egyptian uh, monolith, but also in the monolithical, let's say, time uh, frame uh, worldwide and it didn't stop there uh, because i understood that it is also the case that in more modern cities or more recent cities as you say uh, the same kind of principles were observed you know the alignment of architecture with stars and with geometry in them uh, so i learned about rome i learned about also a star map let's say encoded in uh, in paris not that far away from brussels um, washington dc of course uh, so I started myself the question, yeah, what about Brussels in, in my pure curiosity? And that's where it all started, Scott. That's great. And I want to ask you more specifically about some of the things that you have discovered in Brussels. And what one of the things that jumps out to me is the tree of life pattern that you've identified in the Brussels park and in the Parc de Cinquantenaire. Um, and... I recognize this in in the diagrams in your book, like in the the redesign of London in from the fire of 1666. I think it was Sir Christopher Wren had a plan for the rebuilding of London that involved the tree of life. This is the Kabbalistic pattern of the tree of life from Judaism um, encoded in the streets. Uh, and can you can you tell us more about how you how you discovered that this pattern in Brussels and what does that mean to you? Well actually it goes back to I think two weeks before I went on that trip to Egypt in 2019 where uh, I visited the Louvre Museum in Paris with my family and I wanted to see the Sumerian collection and the Sumerian civilization was discovered very recently actually I think the end of the 19th century uh, and we know now that it predated, at least as far as we know, the ancient Egyptian civilization, and that starts to run in parallel. So while walking around, let's say, uh, in the corridors, uh, looking at those artifacts, I suddenly saw something that caught my eye. There was a floor panel uh, dated 645 BC from Iraq. So that's where Sumeria uh, used to be located. Uh, and there were these, these, these circles that, that looked a bit like circles within circles intertwined. And I was, uh, yeah, let's say, <laughs> a little bit puzzled initially. But I thought it was interesting and I took a picture of it. And what happened 
is that when I uh, was in Egypt in the uh, ancient city of Abydos, uh, that behind the temple of Seti I, there is an older temple called the Osirian. It was roughly 3,000 years old. And my travel guide suddenly started pointing uh, at one of those huge granite pillars. And I looked very closely and then I saw three, let's say, circles. And within those circles, I saw the same pattern, circles within circles. And then he said, that's the flower of life. So, okay, that's interesting. I saw something similar in, uh, in, in, in Paris, in the Louvre. So, and, and, and that comes from, from Sumeria. So there must be a connection. And then I actually realized that uh, this flower of life geometry uh, is used as an underlying uh, geometry for the tree of life, which is basically a subset of these circles. So the tree of life, in short, has uh, 10 circles. In Hebrew, they're called sephirot. And uh, this geometry is used in ancient uh, Jewish uh, mysticism uh, to contemplate on the yeah, 10 divine manifestations of, of God, right? So, so then it started to become suddenly uh, something uh, that had, had meaning and context. And uh, this tradition uh, was also infused uh, particularly in the Middle Ages, uh, the, just before the Renaissance and during the Renaissance, into yeah the the uh, philosophical, let's say, contemplations in in, in Western Europe. Uh, and so I looked at at this geometry, uh, and and then I started at the same time staring at the map of Brussels. Uh, and I I noticed that there was an underlying design that the design of the the Parc du Saint Cantonais. It's uh, it's in French. Um, uh, a park that uh, commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Belgian state that was established in 1831. Uh, and I said, look, I see I see this 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 tree of life as an underside, underlying let's say geometrical pattern. And I and I came with my finding to the travel guide who I know very well uh, that we had in Egypt. And then he said, look what I found. And he was pointing at another park. And this is the central park of Brussels that was uh, established in uh, the late uh, 1800s, so earlier than that, with the same underlying pattern. So we had both, not talking about this with one another, discovered the same underlying pattern in two different parks in Brussels. So you can imagine that, uh, yeah, that, that actually uh, rang a bell and, and, and was really arousing my curiosity. Uh, and indeed, as you say, Scott, later uh, I also read about uh, uh, the Great Fire in London in 1666, where the center was basically made out of wood and uh, wooden houses, uh, was completely destroyed. And, 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 and the idea was to yeah, redo it and with an orderly design. And the designs that you can see on drawing board uh, indeed reveal that the street patterns uh, show this this yeah, geometry. Uh, but because they were in haste and, and, and houses needed to be built quickly, they couldn't wait for these ground projects. You know, it was only partially um, yeah constructed. But nevertheless, uh, you see that the same philosophy was used in the same yeah a bit earlier than that in the same period of time more or less. So you see that yeah, it's not coincidence. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Take away. yeah, and I'm I'm thinking of the of the Orion mystery by Robert Bavall and in, in which he showed the correlation between the three pyramids of Giza and the belt stars of the Orion constellation and how they're laid out in a similar way. And this is echoed in 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 like the th the three magi story and in a lot of ways it is. And you you seem you discovered the Orion constellation encoded in the street plan of Brussels, isn't that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. And and the starting point for that was that I saw an axis in the shape of of a big cross, right? uh, where the long let's say axis uh, was made out of an alignment of a very big church uh, called the Kugelberg Basilic. It's the fifth biggest church in the world, actually, um, in the distance. And then a bit closer, 
the town hall town, which is a medieval, let's say, uh, architecture with the archangel uh, St. Michael on top. And then closer, I was standing in another small church, uh, a chapel uh, that was built uh, in the 12th century, uh, dedicated to St. Jacques de Compostela. And, and that is, you know, exactly in one alignment. And then exactly at the crossing point, there was a road, you know, going to other, let's say, landmarks. So I, I observed a very big cross over the city. Now, we also know that the constellation of Orion, at least the most important uh, stars, form a cross. So you have the three belt stars, but also at the far ends you have a star called Betelgeuse and the other star called Rigel. And uh, that forms a cross. So I was looking at, at, could it possibly be that I find something similar as done with the three ancient pyramids in Gizeh? And we don't have pyramids in Brussels. Uh, so I started to experiment a little bit, and then I noticed that there was a square with an equestrian statue of one of the Belgian kings. And this square had, yeah, a kind of a star-like pattern. Is that okay. that's the square that has the the five by five uh, grid, like the Sator magic square? Is that is that the right one? That's not the right one. That is another one that represents the Pleiades, which is okay. part of the Taurus constellation. Uh, but looking at let's say the cross of a lion, I was first trying to see where are possibly those three belt stars positioned, and uh, I recall. Uh, the importance of Robert Boval's finding, and I, I uh, have watched uh, also his, uh, let's say, his, uh, his story behind it, that suddenly he noticed that these three pyramids are not in a straight line. There's offset. I had to find then another point, what could possibly represent the star, and I came to a square, let's say, just outside this church, dedicated to Saint-Jacques, with again an equestrian statue of, in this case, Godfrey of Bouillon, who was a crusader knight, uh, who became the ruler of Jerusalem, not the king, but the protector of the Holy St. Perkel Church yeah, in a newly established kingdom of Jerusalem. And then I had two points. So if you look at the belt stars, they have a particular offset, indeed, but also the distance has to be uh, in correspondence with the reality. So I took basically a picture, taken my telescope, I overlaid it on the map, where would this other one land then? And it landed just on the old perimeter of the city wall. And I go over there, and what do we see? Another king on a horse, King Leopold II. And this square is also designed with an underlying star geometry. So I have now three distinct points with three distinct centers with star-shaped, let's say, uh, squares and three kings. Well, you mentioned it's called the three magi from the east or the, or the three belt stars of uh, Orion are also referred to as the three kings. So, yeah, then it became really exciting. Uh, so this, this was the, yeah, the big revelation for me that indeed there is a star map also encoded. Apart from the three, and the Orion constellation was correlated with Osiris in ancient Egypt, and if you follow the belt stars roughly in in one direction, they go towards the, the star Sirius, which was correlated with Isis in ancient Egypt. And in Giza, if you follow those belt star, the the three pyramids, they point to ancient Heliopolis, which would have represented Sirius. And in Brussels, if you follow these belt stars out, they point to the Kokelberg Basilica of the Sacred Heart, which represents Sirius. And, and it's a, a long distance to this place, um, just as it is sort of a long distance in the heavens from the belt stars of Orion to Sirius. And so you have this longer scale thing going on even in the street pattern, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, because the, uh, uh, let's say, the star map uh, is encoded by means of architecture that is located in specific distances or proportions of distances. 
And uh, when taking a closer look at this basilica, which is indeed dedicated eh, to the Sacred Heart of, of Jesus, uh, I noticed that uh, running away from the uh, cathedral, or sorry, it is a basilica, I have to be very precise here, there's a big boulevard. And uh, the whole ring road in the city center follows the old city wall perimeter. But there, on the northern part, it is chopped off. Like you chop off, you know, the upper part of an egg to start spooning out your uh, your your breakfast. So so that was that was quite interesting uh, to note. And and I then took the experiment and said, look, you know, as above, so below. Uh, I started uh, to think about well, could it also be that this basilica is aligned in the direction of this boulevard with the spot where Sirius crosses the horizon? And so I went there, I uh, went to the portico, uh, I took my camera, I took a shot, and I used a planetarium to basically uh, calculate. And the, the thing about science is, of course, that you show how to do it. You have the facts, you show how to do it. And then everybody who reproduces the experiment should come to the same result. So I've done that in the book. So you just have to assume uh, for the moment, not having read the book, that indeed uh, it is aligned. And, and why is this so important? Because these, uh, there was one specific moment in the year that the star of uh, Sirius was, uh, was gone for a period of 70 days. Uh, and the moment that the star was visible when rising for the first time, that means that the sun is low enough, so it is dark enough, then uh, the uh, Egyptians knew that the annual flooding of the Nile would start. So the star Sirius uh, uh, and the river Nile have a connection. So the ancient expression was, yeah, the, the river Nile are the tears from Isis. And Osiris was considered to be the fruitile, let's say, uh, sediment uh, that would settle on the, on the riverbanks so the seeds could be planted and then the whole annual cycle you know, of life and that would repeat itself. Mm. And this particular date, uh, when this happens uh, in our part, let's say, of the world, in Europe, is on the 15th of August. That's the date where we celebrate Ascension. Ascension of Maria. Now, Maria is, of course, had a successor, as we all uh, can safely assume, of Isis. And Isis was linked to Sirius. So the 15th of August actually commemorates, you know, the heliacal rising, the sunrise of the star Sirius, as the ancient Egyptians did. And, and so then the, I found the back. axis of this cathedral uh, g stretches, or the basilica of, of the Sacred Heart is what it is. It, that central axis extends into this big avenue of Boulevard Leopold II, and that's aligned with the heliacal rising of Sirius. And that is you know, you see that same thing happen in the Axe Historique in Paris. It's aligned in the same way. And so is Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. And, I mean, isn't these avenues of power are, are all aligned to this ancient Egyptian calendar? And I don't think people really are aware of that. It's fascinating when, when you, you know, you, you're drawn to these mysteries and you and you have to pull out like stellarium this you know very scientific astronomical simulation mm -hmm. that will predict it but then you actually go to the site and take a picture on the on the panorama deck on top of this basilica and you see you can see the the where Sirius appears on the at the end of the boulevard is framed by these two towers on either side. And to me, it's very, very kind of Masonic in the sense it's like Boaz and Jakin, or perhaps it's like the columns in the tree of life, you know? But I think what all of these things represent is the human energy, the human body, ultimately, somehow. They're correlated. Can I jump in, gents, and say hello, first of all? Yeah. I'm enjoying, yeah. I feel like I'm at the movies here, yeah, listening yeah. to you two experts, you know? Um, and it's quite remarkable that your work, Scott, 
um, you know, mirrors in many ways Ronald's work. You know, I mean, you two guys are are really leading edge when it comes to alignments in cityscapes, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's not an area of expertise for me. So I just want to commend you both for the great work you're doing there. And one of the lovely things is just to say to our listeners and our viewers, the way we came across Ronald was through our academy, you know, and we have, uh, we, we were trying to sort of connect with people that share the same passion as Scott and I for sacred geometry. And, you know, here's an example of like, you know, a, a random guy we met on the internet, you know, who happens to share a passion for sacred geometry. And not only that, has written a book and a detailed book about these geometric alignments, in this case, in Brussels, you know. But I wanted to just jump in here on the heliacal rising of Sirius, as if a difficult word to pronounce, heliacal, how do you say that? I think people well, I, say it in different ways. I, I uh -huh. say um, heliacal, and Ronald, how do you say it? Yeah, I also heard heliacal, but uh -huh. to, make okay. it, to make it very simple, it's a sunrise of Sirius. But if I if I understand it correctly, say to go back to the Great Pyramid, and I I, I should credit um, Jonathan Quinton with this because he he said it so beautifully that I believe if this is how it works is that there's only one day in the year, just like you were saying, Ronald where the star Sirius rises before the sun. So the sky is still really dark. And as the star Sirius rises, you know, above the horizon, it shines this kind of like very, very beautiful, almost pink light across the Giza plateau. And I, I hope I'm right in this, but I, I believe it rises to a certain altitude in the sky where it's just perfectly positioned to shine into the queen's chamber, I think. I think it shines, all, or maybe it's the king's chamber, but there's a corridor that's cut all the way through the pyramid, right? That, um, that takes the light beam of Sirius right the way into one of the central chambers. Forgive me now, I think it's the Queen's Chamber, but I can't be certain about that. So, but but just the principle, if I'm correct, is so outstanding if this is what happens. Uh, Jeff, this is a slightly different thing that you're, but you're right, it is serious, but it's the culmination or the highest point that it gets in the sky. And this is Robert Bival's research on these shafts that were cut. And I think it's into the King's Chamber, but it doesn't okay. really matter. There's a shaft that's cut at a very specific angle, and it correlates with the culmination or highest point of Sirius. Now, the yeah. helical rising is different. It's when the star rises on the horizon just before the dawn, because when the uh -huh. sun actually comes up, it's so bright that it drowns out all the stars. Of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so... So that okay, I'm getting I'm getting my my serious movements a little bit muddled then. But um, I was just by the way, can we just take a moment on the majesty of that? So if this particular star is being caught by a structure that has what is it one million three hundred thousand stone blocks all put together, and then somebody like incised a corridor through that block to capture what? this one star in the sky, wouldn't it make you feel, hey, maybe this star is worth paying attention to? Okay. Well, it is, so the, brightest, it is the brightest star in the sky after the sun. Okay. okay. So it's really so, hard to miss, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but doesn't it lead you to think that there's there, there's perhaps something more to it as well? Like, like why would the ancients have been so interested in, it, like I know it's the brightest star, and that's that's obviously would have piqued their interest. But can I just go back to what you mentioned, Ronald? Is there's a basilica in Brussels, and there's a long avenue that rolls out in front of it. Is that correct? And right. is that long avenue then? Does that capture the rising of the sun, the rising of Sirius on that very special day, the fifteenth of August? Correct. It's lined up to catch that. Yep. And is that the same, Scott, as you, you mentioned Pennsylvania Avenue? Where's Pennsylvania Avenue, actually? Where, it's, where? It, looking from the White House towards the Capitol. Oh, it's in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Okay, cool. forgive me about my American geography. Okay, so that's another major avenue. That And is that, again, the exact same thing, Scott? It captures um, it, the it rising... It is also aligned to the same phenomenon, the heliacal rising of Sirius. 
and the Axis Historique. Is that the really cool one that runs all the way through Paris, like from the yeah. Arc de Triomphe, the Carousel, all the way down to the Tesseract, to the Grand Arch? Yeah, correct. Look, you'd stand on the Grand Arch looking... The other way. The, towards the Louvre Pyramid. Okay. So, yeah. like, they're, pretty, they're three pretty major cities, yeah? And and the, the, the you know... So, okay. So let's just take in the plot here a bit, okay? That's a thing, right? That's a thing that you can prove. It's self-evident. I mean, if people want to go out with planetariums and stuff, I haven't done it, but I trust you guys. You know, I'm pretty sure if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. Now, what, what is going on, right? Did all these architects get together and have kind of a secret meeting and say, okay, I'll tell you what, you're going to look after Brussels, Ronald. I'll take care of Paris. Will you do Washington, D.C., Scott? And we're going to do all the buildings, all the planning, all the organization, all of the arrangements so that our main avenues, our third affairs capture. I mean, they're not all main avenues, but but that there's significant major feats of architecture to capture this. Like, what? how do you put meaning over that? What's going on? Is it like a like is it a intentional man made thing? Is it something else more bizarre? I think and there is deep? definitely a Freemasonic connection to these um, a lot of these um, elements, and I think that when you understand the more the esoteric aspects of these things, it's it's very tempting to want to encode them in the things that you build. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Ronald? Well, first of all, what was quite striking to me is that um, I only found out about the alignment of the Axe Historique in Paris with the Star Sirius, uh, I think, just a few weeks ago. Huh. Uh, and uh, I wrote the book completely independently. Uh, I didn't know about Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I wrote the book, but I only saw uh, Scott's fantastic, let's say, uh, uh, compilation of all these cities much later. Uh, so uh, that that already is 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 uh, quite striking, at least for me personally. Uh, Brussels is very close to Paris. If you look at the global scale, uh, uh, if you take the high speed train, it's a one and a half uh, one and a half hour uh, train ride. Uh, so the moment that I learned about this uh, uh, alignment, uh, of course, I went to Google Maps and I took the two. Uh, two maps of the streets, yeah, they run in parallel. It's clear. They are aligned in exactly the same direction. I think Pennsylvania Avenue may have a slight... Uh, they are slightly uh, different because they're at different latitudes and the atmospheric phenomenon are slightly different. There's a really complicated calculator you can use to, to predict the heliacal rising of Sirius, but it takes a lot of different factors into account. It's not just a simple azimuth from north. That there's um, ele you know elevation above sea level. There's atmospheric phenomenon. There's the stellar alignment, and they all have to come together for that to happen. Yeah, um, and high pollution as we have nowadays, which is very different, of course, uh, from people who uh, broke this earth in the Neolithics. I mean, can you imagine if you go to the desert nowadays and it, it's it's dark and you look at the sky, I mean, you see things. It's it's awesome. Mm. We don't see. In your book, you also talk about another phenomenon that I'd never considered, which is the heliacal rising of the belt stars of Orion. And maybe you can tell us more about where you found that in Brussels and and what that represents. And, and, and it's not just a, um, a random thing, but it seems very, very significant to me, the, the architectural monument that you found yeah. that, that where this phenomenon occurs. First of all, Jeff, I haven't forgotten the question that you haven't answered yet, but I'll come back to that later. Who done it? Was it a plot? <laughs> but thank uh, you, Ronald. In um, uh, in all seriousness, um, because when I found these these uh, let's say monuments eh, that would mimic the stars of um, of Orion, the belt stars of Orion, and I found the alignment uh, of the basilica with the actual cosmic phenomena a rising star or Sirius, then I started to see, ah, is there any other cosmic alignment, you know, on the horizon? And uh, indeed, I found this. But 
to explain that, I'll first go to Washington for a second. Because in Washington, eh, we all know that we have this grand mall with this huge uh, uh, obelisk. And uh, the alignment of the mall is due east. And uh, there is one moment in the year where uh, the belt stars of horizon start to rise. And the first of the three, uh, it's named Mintaka, is rising just before sunrise. So it becomes visible for the first time. Guess what? On the 4th of July, Independence Day. Okay. So Belgium is a, a young country. It was established uh, after the defeat of uh, Napoleon and then a 15-year period of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, uh, that uh, there was a small revolt. Belgium became independent, and we talk about 1831. And Belgium is located between the UK, France, Germany, really, you know, the, the, the power, uh, say the big powers, uh, in addition to Russia, in Europe. And Belgium is exactly in the middle. So we often talk about yeah, maintaining the balance uh, uh, of power uh, to maintain peace. So Belgium was created then as a kind of a buffer state. So how was this politically reconciled? There was, uh, in the end, uh, uh, a king from uh, the UK, uh, King Leopold, uh, who was married uh, to the successor of the throne, but she died, and he never became king in the UK. He was offered the throne in Greece, but he refused because it was too unstable. And there was his opportunity. But he had to re be reconciled uh, with uh, by marrying the daughter of the French king, Louisa Marie. So the whole idea was that he would be, uh, let's say, sworn in on a new constitution that was written uh, before that by a big national congress. Uh, and uh, the constitution needed to be finished so that he could swore, swear uh, his loyalty or allegiance uh, to the constitution, hence a, mo uh, a constitutional monarchy. So he was uh, uh, sworn in on the uh, 21st of July, 1831. And guess what? That is the date of the Hellenic rising of Orion. So it's the Belgian Independence Day. And uh, there is a, a wow, nice fascinating. pillar monument uh, in, in Brussels that shows the alignment. And I've described it in my book in exactly the same way as I did with the Basilica. And then his son built a huge monument. It's a tripartite arcade in the Parc du saint Cantonaire. So one of these two parks with the Tree of Life design. It's it's like and, a, it's like a Roman triumphal arch with three yeah, arcs, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah, it's it's like the Arc de Triomphe, but then with two smaller arcs on the side. Yeah, and you see Orion rising, you know, exactly through the middle arch, you know. So, so yeah. it's 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 really it's really uh, astonishing if you look at it like that, and then you start to see a pattern. You start to see the people behind it. Uh, and, and there are too many components, uh, mathematically speaking, uh, there are so many components in this star map that the chance of, of coincidence is, is zilch, right? So, mm -hmm. so that, is, that is, I think, uh, uh, really amazing about uh, the design of Brussels that took place since it became independent, and it lasted until the early, let's say, 20th century, so 1907 or so. And throughout this whole period, all these different pieces were yeah, created. And, and that's fascinating. So, Ronald, I have a question about the location of this, this triumphal arch or arcade in the, in the park. Um, you've identified a tree of life in this park. And so where does this archway fit within that pattern? Well, this middle arch... Uh, correlates with uh, a circle or sephiroth that is called Dad. And actually, it's not a sephiroth. It's, it's, it's a kind of a black hole, so to speak. Um, and um, the idea behind it is that uh, you become aware of it by the virtue of obtaining, let's say, a higher knowledge. 
And only if you have this higher level of consciousness, you can see it. And then also access, let's say, the higher sephiroths on the tree. So you climb in the tree, so to speak. And in the top, you know, it's really the most sublime, let's say, manifestations of the divine. Uh, so it's a kind of a gateway. Um, and, uh, yeah, I give it away, actually, already, because there is this huge gate. Uh, and through the gate, you can see the three belt stars of Orion rising. And and this relates to the ancient Osiris myth, where uh, Osiris was uh, ruling the, the netherworld. Uh, so after a, a pharaoh would uh, disease, uh, he would be taken to the last judgment. Uh, he would be taken by the hand, as we know from the Dead Scrolls. Uh, or the Book of the Dead, I have to say, it has to be very precise, um, that are part of ancient Egyptian uh, stellar religion. And he was taken by the hand by Anubis to a weighing scale. And this weighing scale uh, was uh, uh, put in place by uh, uh, the uh, goddess of Ma'at. Uh, Ma'at has a feather on her head. She is the cosmic uh, goddess of uh, war and order. And uh, the idea was uh, to see if adjustment, or sorry, if adjustment would be favorable or not. So if the pharaoh would have had a good life, his heart yeah, was put on one end of the weighing scale and the feather of Mart on the other scale. And if he had a good life, then it, it, it would be a par. But if not, if the heart would be heavy, yeah, uh, the, uh, the weighing scale will, uh, will tilt. And then uh, the consequence of that is that uh, the heart of the pharaoh got eaten alive by a monster called Amit. It was a compilation of a, a crocodile, a lion, and a hippo. It's very awful. And then you could uh, basically consider your soul to be destroyed forever. So it's very dramatic. Uh, but if it was at par, uh, it's good. Um, and then also an another god in the Egyptian pantheon will give uh, his blessing and record everything. That's uh, Toth, the god of wisdom and uh, scribe. And then the uh, pharaoh, the deceased pharaoh, will be taken by the hand by the god Horus. He is the son of Osiris and, uh, and Isis. And uh, he would lead, let's say, the pharaoh then to his father, uh, Osiris, who would then basically make the conclusion that the verdict complete. And that would allow the pharaoh to reach eternal life. And the way mm. this eternal life was accessed, is that the soul of the pharaoh would elevate or ascend or climb on a ladder, what you like, to a place in the cosmos called the Duat. And the Duat is an area where the constellation of Orion is positioned, together with Sirius, by the way. And this Orion constellation would act as the gateway to reach the polar stars. And the polar stars never rise and never set. They're always there. And that means that the pharaoh, uh, in its internal life, uh, will become a star in the polar region, never dies. And that is the eternal life. So in that sense, yeah, you see these alignments. You see the, uh, let's say, the, the, the positioning uh, in uh, the tree of life, where it, it exactly correlates with the gateway but also in the ancient Egyptian stellar religion, this gateway uh, has, has a meaning. Uh, I, I also see another layer here with the position of Doth in the, in the Tree of Life, in that there are 10 Sephiro, not including Doth, because it's hidden, and there are 22 paths connecting the Sephiro, and that adds up to 32 elements. And then when Doth is revealed, it becomes the 33rd and final element. And so mm. this, this tension between 32 and 33 is echoed in the Scottish Rite, for example. And in many other phenomena, I've, got, I've given a lecture um, that I, I think you attended, Ronald, in our live membership, where I went really deeply into this tension between 32 and 33, but I find that especially gratifying to see that this, this archway is in that location of this 33rd element, this last step 
that that completes the the hero's journey if you will and it it acts as the kind of stargate for the soul to move on to the next level um and it it it's very beautiful when you think about how all of this is encoded um in the the streets and civic monuments in brussels mm. and it's it's like a classic secret in plain sight it's there for those who have eyes to see to decode the pattern it's available to everyone and mm. i find that really uplifting in a way that that you have decoded the city for us and now we we get to enjoy the fruit of your revelations and your discoveries and we get to see brussels in a whole new light and appreciate it on a whole different level than we would have just looking at it with our mundane eyes just seeing architecture buses street furniture you know what i mean we're seeing this whole pattern unfold that speaks to us inside it's it's a personal kind of journey of of growth that the city is sort of encouraging us to go on i think um i love it scott i love what you're saying and this is where it gets really meaningful yeah you know i i'd i would love just to ask you a a, a, a clarification question there you were speaking about this arch which is in the place where the unseen Sephiroth Doth is in the Tree of Life, if I'm understanding it. And then you said, this is where you see the belt of Orion rise through the middle arch or something. If I'm, I'm just, because I, I haven't read your book, so I'm trying to get my head around these, these alignments. And the, the three and then, stars are kind of vertical when, when they do, do their helium rise. The, it's I like they're it. right, yeah. they're going straight the up, right in the middle. Yeah. You, unbelievable but then you also said that that um coincidentally enough it's also where sirius is you said and is there some kind of directional thing because then you said so you've got orion then sirius does something and then they point to the polar stars and then i love that kind of metaphorical or allegorical reference about how those stars never never are not shining so there's like they're eternally bright and um, which is so symbolic you know of eternal life or whatever so so I was kind of catching what you were saying there, but could I ask you to bring me through that one again, please, Ronald? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, the actual, uh, let's say, phenomenon of the rising belt uh, stars of Orion. Uh, if you are on the equator, uh, Washington is a bit further south than Brussels, you see them, uh, let's say, rising straight, right? If you're further north, then it happens a bit on your side. So the stars drift away a little bit, a bit mm -hmm. more in the southern direction. So they are drifting. That means that uh, when you first see the three belt stars of Orion rising, later in time, you see the star of Sirius rising. They say also in ancient Egypt that Sirius follows her husband, right? So... And so the stars of Orion rise at a slightly different location. They, the, the Mintaka rises exactly in the east, but Sirius is a little bit further to the south, just a little mm -hmm. bit further. So that means that if you look at the uh, big boulevard that runs away from the Basilica that is aligned with the rising of Sirius, has a slightly different angle. You see? And in the park, it is uh, located in a way that, that points due east. Okay, so that, that's to be precise. Uh, your question was, well, what about, you know, the, the meaning of this? And, and uh, yeah, that's also what kids say. You know, I want to become a star, an eternal star. Eh? Light is also, of course, linked to the philosophy, philosophical idea of enlightenment. Eh? To, to make sure that uh, we are uh, getting rid of all the things that are not so positive. Right, so so it's shining a light on on on, on what has been uh, what has been a shadow, uh, and so so this is also the, the idea that we that we have today. But in the ancient Egyptian stellar religion, yeah, the ultimate goal of the pharaoh was uh, to prepare all his life uh, to get to that stage where he could go through that portal and become an eternal star, 
and shine forever. Wow, that's amazing. I love that, Ronald. Beautiful. Any chance we can go back to my other question and tick in the plot with that one? <laughs> We're going to let that one go slide. But let's let's have some fun with that one. Who did it? Why did they do it? What's the story? You know, blah, blah, blah. That whole can of worms. Well, let me first start with the facts. Okay, so, so here I am in my curiosity, you know, I, I read about patterns in architectures and and then I rediscovered uh, that these kind of patterns also exist in, in the city of Brussels. So that, that's fact. You can see it. You can look at it. I can demonstrate it. I can explain it. Uh, if you go on my city tours, you can touch it. Uh, I want to do that, by the way. I'm definitely like, this is, I have no plans to go to Brussels, but now I'm definitely visiting, you know, to do your tour. That's the single reason I'm going. <laughs> that would be a very good reason to go, apart from yeah. the job. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> uh, now, here, 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 here we are. Yeah? And then, of course, yeah, uh, this is not by itself satisfactory because it doesn't just drop from the sky, not even stars. So, so it doesn't drop from the sky. Uh, the question then, of course, is who did it? And my research has also focused on that. And I said, look, who was the architect? Who was the financer and so forth? And um, it appeared that uh, in this period between, let's say, the mid 1830s until uh, the early 1900s, um, there was uh, a continuous, let's say, uh, collaboration between um, architects, urban planning, planners, sculptures, politicians, uh, the king, uh, King Leopold I, but also his son, king, king Leopold II, who was nicknamed the Builder King, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bankers, industrialists, and that by itself is not so surprising. Uh, but the common element is that to a large extent, not all, but to a large extent, these people were also uh, a member of the Freemasonic fraternity. And the question that I started myself is to ask myself, okay, so so if you know what has been done, if you know who done it, then why did they do this? And it is common knowledge that uh, the uh, Freemasonic community considers Egypt as their philosophical homeland. And so the Egyptian traditions is also partly uh, uh, present in the uh, Masonic belief system. And so um, this, this uh, shows that uh, uh, the ancient wisdom that was kept, let's say, in the temples of, of Egypt and other parts of, of, of the world, actually, somehow yeah, transitioned throughout time, uh, outside Egypt, but also to, to Rome and so forth. It moved west. It moved west all across the Atlantic. Uh, so there have been people who were initiated in this part of the Western mm -hmm. traditions, whether they were, yeah, let's say, um, a temple priest in Egypt or whether they were alchemists or uh, uh, before that, yeah, uh, members of the school of Plato or Rosicrucians or whatever you want. And somehow... It managed the system of people who had an influence in mm. shaping a city. And uh, what I have done, actually, is some additional research that uh, shows also a pattern of all these cities where, where, where this is uh, the case. It has always uh, been in a situation where you have an enlightened, uh, even a despotic sometimes, uh, ruler, uh, somebody who has uh, an enlightened vision, but also has the determination uh, to persevere over this long period of time to make this a reality. Uh, you always have uh, a capital. So Brussels, there's a new capital of a new kingdom. What not that many people who read Anglo-Saxon literature know is that, for example, there was a capital in one of the states of Germany, in Baden, there was also a capital called Karlsruhe. This capital is very interesting. 
It's very interesting to talk about it at another time. But also here we have a ruler who was also an alchemist, was very tolerant. Tolerance is also an important characteristic. Uh, you have many people coming to, to together to, to invest and to shape. Uh, and also by practicing these uh, fraternic, let's say, um, uh, activities. So, so here we are in Brussels in that time frame. Uh, and at the same time, uh, let's say, period, Washington was established. And we know, of mm. course, that yeah, Washington, you had George Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Scott is, is, is much better in position to explain everything that, that underlies the, the, uh, the Washington urban planning. Yeah, there's and a so you there's see a, these commonalities. There's a trun truncated pyramid and a lot of symbolism in DC, but um, <laughs> in Karlsruhe, there's a truncated pyramid with 32 radiating streets around it. So it, it's kind of a golden age of, of urban symbolism. Mm. Yeah, and that city was built in 1715. So, so guys, let's say, um, let's say, so there seems to be some kind of logical um, explanation for the Freemasonic um, fraternity and um, being heavily involved in, you know, politics, town planning, banking. Um, so it's not a huge stretch to imagine their influence has been infused into these city plans. And I wonder, like, and it, this goes all the way back through through all the, the cultures you mentioned there, Ronald, and all the way back to Egypt, where there seems to be a deep reverence for the star Sirius, particularly, I, see, I, I seem to think, also uh, the three stars of Orion's belt. And I take your point that it's like symbolically it represents enlightenment or, you know, there, there, it has those nice spiritual kind of symbolic messages, but I can't help but feel there must be something more to this obsession with Sirius. Uh, the, the thing that I keep on going back to is just a whole pyramid being aligned to catch that one star in the sky. Well, like in, in, in New Grange in Ireland, you know, is aligned to Sirius, I believe. And, 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 bet, and, and so this is, is not just a Freemasonic idea. This is really a super ancient idea. Super it's ancient. It's being encoded in these things. Mm. Uh, and, and even it's much more modern. There's a whole other layer in Brussels about the European Union and, and how it's kind of the capital of Europe. And there's a certain level of symbolism there that you've, that you've discussed, uh, uh, Ronald. That, that's fascinating as well. And there's er, kind of urban alignments that are related to that layer of civilization um, that came after the kind of golden age of Freemasonry, let's say between 1700 and 1900. And I find that fascinating that this, this hasn't just stopped. It, it, there's, there's things still going on um, that are encoded in the city plan and in the architecture. And I wonder if it's if it's all so conscious or if there's some aspects where we end up building things without being aware of them. Just as most people aren't aware of these encodings in the city, were the designers even aware of it? Or are they somehow part of some larger like campaign of consciousness to encode these things? What, what do you think about that, Ronald? Well, I can, I can, let's say, respond to this at, at different levels, okay? So the first level is, okay, so what is behind this? You have this explanation of the ancient Egyptian stellar religion, um, but that does not explain necessarily, uh, because this is linked to Orion uh, and, and Sirius, uh, but what 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 it does not explain is that in uh, in Egypt you have more pyramids, you know, mapped out along the River Nile that mimic a greater part, you know, of the northern and also southern hemispheres. Uh, there's literature on this; you can you can simply see it. Yeah. So, um, I think Wayne Wayne Herschel has done a good. Wayne uh, Herschel, he's done mapping. fantastic work. Yeah. 
on that. Uh, I think he mapped out uh, about 50 pyramids or so, only 50 pyramids. I mean, correlating wow. very strongly with stars in the cosmos, and, and he did it. So Robert Bolval focused on the three pyramids in, in Gizeh, uh, and he did the whole thing. Uh, so the chances of coincidence yeah, is, 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 is close to zero. Uh, so uh, what Robert Bolval uh, uh, and Graham Hancock actually wrote in their book uh, called Talisman, where they also look at uh, these kind of architectures and try to grasp a little bit the history behind this, uh, is that uh, is there reference to the ancient pyramid text. There, there are uh, text inscribed in a wall inside the pyramid uh, in Saqqara. Uh, I cannot recall the pharaoh's name uh, at, at the moment, but there are uh, mostly... Djoser, D-J-O-S-E-R. Djoser. Uh, Djoser was of the Step Pyramid. Yeah. I think the Pyramid of Unas or so, but I'm, I'm not okay. 100%. So forgive me uh, if I'm not, not uh, entirely uh, precise here. Um, and pyramids normally don't have any uh, graffiti, no, no, no scripts, no, no, nothing, you know, uh, no hieroglyphs. But this one has, and and part of the text actually points to the holy duty of the pharaoh to build a copy of the perfect sky on earth. So the, the sky, yeah, the cosmos was perfect. The earth was, yeah, uh, imperfect, yeah? and so. And the whole idea behind this, to make a long story short, is that by building a copy of the perfect heaven, there will be, let's say, a positive vibe coming from the cosmos to the earth for the prosperity of, of the pharaoh's people. Mm, I love that, that, that Ronald. The beauty of the pharaoh. Uh, so that, 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 that was echoed right. later by, by the hermetic idea of as above, so below. You know, exactly. And brought uh, to the European saying, Renaissance because, you know, and that's kind of where where we get it now is is we're connecting to the super ancient knowledge through this kind of chain of custody um, mm. up to the present time. And these ancient text talks are also about the city, yeah, a heavenly city. And in Christianity, we know this as the New Jerusalem. There is this city, you know, coming from the sky, where John mm -hmm. the Evangelist had a vision. Uh, of the city, and it is described in the Bible, including trees of life, uh, and uh, London, with a tree of life design attempt at the same, uh, was referred to also as uh, Jerusalem on the Thames. Uh, so, so this idea uh, also goes even to the city of Karlsruhe, where uh, the Mark Graf of Baden. Uh, had a dream, that's even a painting of him, that he had a dream of a city, and he was dreaming of that truncated, let's say, pyramid with uh, a sun with 32 rays, you know, on, on, on its on its apex. Uh, and that's the design, design of, 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 the, of the city. Mm. So this, this whole idea uh, also alludes to, yeah, inspiration uh, and, and intuition. Uh, mm. And, and it's, it, it's quite remarkable uh, indeed, that uh, I did not read anything about, uh, let's say, uh, other cities, uh, uh, except uh, yeah, uh, what I what I looked at uh, uh, in the context of, of Brussels, uh, how could, did it come into being? But I hadn't seen Scott's uh, wonderful documentary, for example. Uh, I didn't know this, and That's here incredible. I, yeah, and here I must also blend in uh, a bit more intuition because uh, it took me two years to write a book, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, explaining and so forth, and there it is after two years. But this has been a journey uh, during which I also had moments that I said, hey, what is happening? We were just talking about this um, beautiful arcade through which you can see, if you look in the eastern direction, the stars of Orion rising. And the other day I was sitting underneath the arch and I was contemplating uh, how, how would everything fit together? What about this park? And did I overlook anything? And at that moment, a bus driver comes to me with a map in his hand and he asks me, where is this square? And it was another square that I was actually interested in. So I got a hint very strongly <laughs> there. Uh, 
and indeed that square had a meaning and I started to yeah pick up on it and also describe it and this other square is linked with the towers constellation uh, so here yeah there is some something that 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 I call synchronicity is at work uh, those of you who are familiar with the work of Carl Jung uh, who has a lot you know, written a lot about uh, synchronicity and our common let's say unconsciousness also a collective unconsciousness that there's a lot of let's say wisdom that we are not aware of and intuition that comes to the surface and that's a bit uh, yeah, on a very personal note what i experienced on a couple of moments mm. there and, and yeah then you come to the same to the same conclusions and then there is a fantastic uh, sacred geometry uh, academy and then then we are suddenly in a podcast so it can it can happen <laughs> that's amazing ronald and thank you for sharing the personal side of it you know because i feel you know i really feel those components of your sharing when you're explaining that you're under the arch and some random bus driver comes up and pulls out a map and and then that becomes a meaningful part of your journey um i'm i have experienced myself that when i work with geometry and and you know geometric archetypes i have really witnessed a very amplified sense of coincidences and a kind of a mirroring of what's going on in my internal psychic world kind of like literally flashing up straight in front of me in material reality, which is just that whole Jungian synchronistic thing, the, the blending of mind and matter he talks about, you know, and I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm so far downstream with this sacred geometry stuff now that for me, this is just a, an innate part of working with geometry and um, that coincidences seem to get amplified and so would I be right in saying that's been very much part of your journey with this work, like since you started it? Actually, yes. Uh, and that has to do with uh, not just a piece of knowledge, but it then also comes with the experience as you yeah, explain yourself at a certain moment, you, you think, what is this? And then you try to understand and, and but sometimes it's the other way around. You read about it, and ah, so that's what it is. And you become more conscious of it. And in my case, yeah, I, I, I have concluded basically that uh, if I hadn't tuned in, it probably would not have manifested. Yeah. So I was I was tuned in. You know, I was on this this track, and suddenly, the, the, yeah, you call it consciousness. Yeah? I, uh -huh. uh, of which uh, I feel uh, we are all part, uh, it starts to, to, to play ball with us. Yeah. You yeah. know, because the whole, this whole, let's say, way of building cities, uh, uh, of course, cannot just happen without the manual labor that you put in, the design, the ideas, and it has to be put into matter, right? But at the same time, uh, yeah, uh, there there is something that that links this together, like a kind of a, a, an invisible field Beautiful. of consciousness. Sorry, Ron, and, like just uh, you broke up there. Did did you say the stars begin to play ball with us? Is that what you said? No, there? Stars, I say this 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 higher level of consciousness or so or the cosmos, whatever you want to call it, uh, starts to interact. Yeah, because yeah. I got hints, I got hints, you know, so. But this is a very personal, let's say, interpretation. Uh, but I've noticed this too frequently to say this is coincidence. Yeah, well, it, I it, feel exactly the same. I, I see it as kind of an urban alchemy. When you when you get your mind into the city plan and you understand these these secrets in plain sight, it it really is a an allegory for you to level up your consciousness to progress on your own journey. And I think that was the goal of a medieval alchemy was to transmute, not just lead into gold, but to transmute the kind of dross of your soul into something finer and more refined and more leveled up. You feel like that too, Scott, don't you? Definitely. I think that the more I work with geometry, the more it kind of subtly upgrades me. And um, it's hard to articulate, 
but I recognize that this is happening. And mm -hmm. yeah, and you can look out in the world and find these patterns, but you can also draw them on your on paper and go inward with the same patterns. And it kind of is a a vehicle for consciousness to to connect with higher or deeper realms of existence of the psyche. Mm -hmm. And I find it very um amazing and I recommend it, but I, it's not really for everyone. You kind of have to come to it on your own accord. And then there's this huge kind of journey you can go on. Mm. Just like every hero gets called to adventure, but they might not necessarily respond to that call until they're ready. Mm -hmm. exactly. yeah. And then, then they have to go on the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that connection, I, I just wanted to remind us that this hermetic principle, as above, so below, is only part of it. Because it goes as above, so below, as within, so without, as the universe, so the soul. Mm. And I think that is exactly what Scott is explaining here. Mm. Yeah, and, and I know, Scott, I mean, I know you so well now that I'm, I know you've had many coincidences and many um, experiences with you know, your, your numbers and, you know, seeing those manifest and, you know, do you have any, uh, you've had a good experience of, of like coincidences occurring and would you attribute some of that to the work you've done with geometry? Yeah. Um, I think that geometry is just a vehicle. So the more, the deeper, the farther you go with that vehicle, sometimes coincidences will start to occur like fast and furious and yeah. i think it's a signaling me mechanism from a higher domain to let, indicate to you that you're on the right path and to give you sort of encouragement where the where the exterior world is starting to mirror your interior states mm -hmm. and vice versa i guess there's an interplay there we're kind of co-creators of that and exactly. and and you just come into resonance with the world around you and everything it sort of becomes alive and full of in, intention and wisdom and and you start to i don't know it's it's just amazing so and there's something about that you know that aha moment because let's be honest coincidences and synchronicities they're deeply subjective and deeply personal right but you know in your heart when you feel one that has meaning you know like i've had a i've had a few that have like bowled me over so much they've been so powerful i've needed to lie down you know like simple stuff like i was thinking about the golden ratio and dodecahedrons and then i saw it on a window in front of me you know like these but that that kind of goes like oh yeah jeff that's kind of cute whatever but it's the it's almost the, the 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 feeling of of this this overwhelming charge of like this is significant you know i almost feel it land like in my heart to it's like this endorsement of what's going on, you know? I mean, I, I haven't really worked it out much more than that. I feel similar to you, Scott, you know? Um, and it seems like you, you've you opened to that, Ronald, as well, that side of it. Um, and like, I, I have no answer. It's like a mystery to me, you know? It's a, but it's a wonderful mystery and one that I really cherish having the opportunity to explore and can kind of... Um, you know, recommend it more highly, I suppose. You know, get into geometry, folks. The rabbit hole goes deep. Well, I think this is a good place to conclude our talk today. And I just want to thank you so much, Ronald, for joining us and enlightening yeah. us with the the Brussels Da Vinci Code. I think I really recommend everybody read this book and tune in to the patterns that are all around us. Um, as a vehicle for inner exploration. And before we get cut off, I was just going to say, Ronald, have you got anywhere people could go so that they could see your work and um, maybe attend your, your tours? Where would be a good place to, to connect with you on the web? Well, I have a website, www.brusselsdavincicode, in one word, dot .eu. And there you'll find all the information about the book, the walks and lectures. So 
I think that's a good place to land. And you can also contact me via the website. And I'll be happy to, to hear from you. Amazing. Well, I want to do one of those tours. Sign me up. I'm on my way. Got you, Jeff. Looking forward. <laughs> but there is always an open door for you too, be it a little bit further away from Brussels. But should you be around on your trip? I would love to. Yeah, that's on my bucket. Next list. European tour, Scott. Yeah, exactly.